Sunday. We'll take your copy of God's Word and let's meet together in Romans chapter 6. We have made our way out of the great exchange portion of Paul's argument to the Romans as he articulates to them the gospel. He explains the multifaceted wisdom of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now he's going to spend all of chapter 6 telling us that we are now called to live free. That because of the grace of God in Christ, as chapter 5 told us, we are now free to live. And we see this in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And if you would, would you stand with me for the honor in the honor of reading God's word? Romans 6 states, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray together. Lord, we live in a world filled with things that are temporary. We live in a world where we are consumed by the moment and that which only lasts for a millisecond, a second, but a a moment in, in comparison to eternity. Focus our eyes this morning on your eternal and good and true word. Focus us on the word that never fails. Focus on the word that tells us that because of what Christ has done, we have been set free and now we are to live free. And this morning, my prayer is that the gospel message will conquer the hearts of sinful men and women in this room and make them new, that it'll conquer the heart of the believer who is putting the chains of sin back on themselves and not living in the freedom that you give. My prayer is that your Holy Spirit will take your word and will do the work only you can do. And help us to worship you now through listening to what your word says. And we give you all the honor and glory and praise for it. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. What does it mean to be free? What does it mean when we talk about freedom? I mean, if you look at the literal definition of the word freedom, it means to not be under the control or in the power of another, able to act or be as one pleases. That's the literal definition of the word freedom. When we hear that definition, we are warm-blooded Americans. We say that's right. We are not under the power of anybody else. We are not under the authority of any kind of other government or any foreign power. We are free. We have a whole day dedicated to celebrating our freedom. Well, we put on a fireworks show to entertain the astronauts in space. We let them know we are a free nation. But does the Bible teach that freedom is how we want to define it? Does the Bible teach that freedom is not being under the power or the authority of another? And we're free to do as we wish. Is that the Bible's definition of freedom? I would say it's not. The Bible's definition of freedom is not that you are now free to do whatever you want. It's not that you're no longer under the reign and rule of someone. Or the Bible says freedom is you're now under the reign and rule of a good master. So the Bible teaches that we were under enslavement to an unloving, to a cruel master named sin, the flesh, and the devil. We were under their reign and their rule. But by the power of Christ at the cross and his resurrection, we've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. But we might think that means, okay, we've been set free. Because Christ says who the Son sets free is free indeed. That means we can now do whatever we want. We're free to do what we wish. We've got our get out of hell free card. We're good to go. That's not what the Bible teaches about freedom. The Bible doesn't tell you that you are now your own person. The Bible doesn't teach you that you are now the captain of your fate. You're the master of your soul. The Bible teaches that you are still under the reign and rule of another. But instead of being under the reign and rule of a cruel and hate-filled master, you are under the reign and rule of a good master. You see, freedom is not found from Christ. Freedom is found only in Christ. You want to live free? You want to be free to live as Romans 6 teaches? It's not going to be found apart from Christ. You only find freedom in him and under his rule. But the life that Christ offers, 
while it might not seem like our idea of freedom, it gives us the freedom our souls long for. Because we are not set free from sin to then do as we please. We are set free from sin to be who he has called us to be. We are set free from sin to live under the reign of Christ, to be his slaves. As Paul will say later on in Romans chapter 6, we are set free from sin to live free in Christ. Because only the life found in Christ makes us free. This is what Paul is going to teach here in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. A whole chapter dedicated to what does it mean to live free. So what does it mean for us to live free? What does it mean to have life in Christ? That we've been set free and now we are free to live. What is Paul going to tell us? Well, he's going to tell us now two actions that we can take because we are free in Christ. And the first is that we are set free to embrace God's grace. We are set free to embrace God's grace. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? I mean, what Paul does here is extremely strategic. He knows what his opponents are going to bring up. He's already talked about his opponents to a degree. Those who would say, well, if you don't have to follow the law and it's only about grace, then that means you can do whatever you want. Grace will abound. In fact, if grace abounds where sin abounds, then that means you should keep on sinning so that you can experience God's grace to a greater level. Paul knows that's the objection in coming to his gospel. So he poses the question himself. Does this mean that we are to continue in sin so that grace may abound? And then he emphatically says, by no means. In fact, you want to get the strength of what Paul is saying here? He essentially says, God forbid. God forbid we would, take, we would abuse God's grace like this. God forbid that we would think that now that we've been set free in Christ, we can do whatever we want, and if we want to experience more grace, we need to keep on sinning, because when we keep on sinning, that's when we experience more grace. Paul says, don't think that. Paul says, that's not why you've been given grace. Paul says, that's not why you've been set free. You are set free not to abuse grace, but to embrace grace. To not continue in your sin any longer. You wrestle with it, yes, but not to be dominated by it. Don't abuse God's grace. Embrace God's grace. See, often in our culture, we treat grace as though all it is is a get out of hell free card. You walk the aisle, you say the prayer, you get baptized, then that means you're not going to go to hell when you die. And that means you can do whatever you want because you've got your ticket. You can live for yourself, you can live doing what you so desire, and you turn that ticket into your life and you're good to go. That's what Paul objects to here. He is saying that's not how a Christian is supposed to live. But we might be tempted to think, okay, well, we don't do that. We don't go around and use grace to do whatever sin we want to commit. We don't, we don't go and use God's grace in such a way that we just kind of do what we want. So we're, we're free and clear of abusing God's grace. But before you think that, I'm pretty confident in saying we all abuse God's grace. See, we like to think at times that abusing God's grace just means that we continue sinning or doing what we want to do, and we just do so under the guise of we're going to be okay when we die. But isn't it abusing God's grace when you know you're saved by grace and then you rely on yourself to live the Christian life? Isn't it abusing God's grace when you view grace just as the result of when you stumble rather than what strengthens you to live? Isn't it abusing God's grace when we think, okay, God saved me from my sin by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, but now it's up to my work, my effort, what I do, and that's what I'm supposed to do. It's all on me, but when I mess up, that's when I need grace. Is that not abusing God's free grace? Treating it as though you only need it when you mess up? Rather than realizing that being free to embrace God's grace means that you depend on grace every minute of every day. Abusing God's grace is not just giving in to the very apparent sin that you want to give in to, thinking that you're okay. Abusing grace is when you say, I only need it when I mess up, instead of realizing without God's grace, you'll always mess up. See, the author of Hebrews has a strong warning for those who want to abuse the grace of God. In Hebrews 10, verse 29, he says, How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. The author of Hebrews is saying, you think you're okay if you say, oh, I've got my get out of hell free card and now I do whatever I want and you essentially trample underfoot the blood of Christ? 
The author of Hebrews gives a strong warning. Don't do it. Do not trample underfoot the blood of Jesus. Do not abuse God's grace. It will not end well for you. So the author of Hebrews is saying here is not that you will lose your salvation if you continue in sin. But if you continue in unrepentant sin, it reveals the genuineness of your salvation. Meaning if you're okay with living in active sin, I'm okay doing whatever I want to do. I'm okay continuing in my sin. I'm okay to keep living this way. I'm okay to keep doing this. And God's grace will cover me in the last day. I'm confidently, I can confidently say, I, I don't believe you know the Lord. See, in Sunday school this morning, we, we talked about in my class about how the root of every problem in the church is found in what it's called tiny God syndrome. Or God's done his part, but now we do ours. God's done his part. He's just this passive, loving God. He's in the heavens. He just wants you to be happy. He just wants you to do whatever you want to do. Oh, he's paved a way for you not to go to hell. Just make sure you're at church at least two to three times a week. Make sure you tithe. Make sure you do this, and God's happy with you. Can I tell you that at this church, I have no interest in leading a people who have that tiny of a view of God? That if you're okay with that small of a view of God, you don't know God. So the Bible says the reason why we abuse grace is that we ignore the God who's given grace. We abuse grace when we ignore the God who has given it. When we think grace is a get out of hell free card, we can do whatever we want. We can live however we choose to live. God's done his part. Now he needs us to do our part. God doesn't need you for anything. God with his word can do anything. Everything he says his word out to do, he has chosen to use you. He doesn't need you to do your part. He does your part better than you do. And yet we think, I can abuse God's grace. I have God's grace. It's for when I mess up only, instead of realizing the God of all creation has given you his grace to say, this is what you need to live for my glory. This is what you need to be sanctified. This is what you need to live out your salvation with fear and trembling. We abuse grace when we minimize it, and we minimize the God who's given it. Grace is so much greater than the solution to your problem when you mess up. Grace is what gives you everything you need to live in this life. Don't abuse God's grace. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You want to stop abusing the grace of God and get a right view of God. Notice what does Paul say? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's not enough fear of God in our churches. There's not enough holy trembling before God in our lives. You know how I know that? You know how you can know that? Because our culture would look so much different if there was. We go, well, the world's just getting worse and worse. It's not our fault. But the church is meant to be salt and light. The decline of the culture, we can just passively say, well, it's because sin abounds and it's because it's awful. But doesn't the Bible say grace abounds all the more? You want to see your culture change? Then get a big view of God and quit abusing his grace. Cling to it. Embrace it. Because here's the good news. It is offered freely at every moment. It is not withheld from you. You will never exhaust it. And it gives you all that you need for life and godliness. Embrace the grace of God that you desperately need, that I desperately need every minute of every hour. Don't abuse the grace of God because grace has set you free from sin. Look at verse 2. By no means, how can we who died in sin still live in it? Listen to the question that Paul is really asking there. Because in chapter 5, you'll remember, he talked about how all those in Adam are under the reign of death. 
All those in Adam are dead in their trespasses and sins. But at the end of chapter 5, he comes in and says, But Christ, the true and better Adam, has conquered death. He has given grace upon grace. And where death reigns, grace reigns even greater. That where sin abounds, grace superabounds. And so now he's saying, if you have died to sin, how can you still live in it? And that word, die to sin, means sin no longer has power over your life. Wrestle with that thought for a moment. Sin does not have power in your life more than you give it. That sin's penalty is not yours to pay anymore. Christ has paid it. So you have died to sin. If you are in Christ, meaning you are saved, you are born again, that means sin doesn't reign over you. It means the power of sin doesn't reign over you. It means the penalty of sin doesn't reign over you. The only power sin has in your life is the power you give it. Does this mean that we can be perfect? Absolutely not. But it does mean that that sin you just can't seem to shake. That sin that has just so entangled you, that sin that has its grips on you, it doesn't have that power over you. You can escape. See, John Piper, well-known pastor, faithful man for many, many years, used this illustration as he was preaching about the issue of pornography and men, talking about how men often say that they're just so addicted they can't break free from it. And he uses this drastic illustration to show that you can break free from it. He said, oh, so you're addicted? You can't break free? What if someone broke into your house and said, I will slaughter your wife and your children if you watch pornography? Are you so addicted that you'd have to go watch it, or would you stop? Well, you'd stop. You wouldn't want your wife or your children to be slaughtered because sin doesn't have that kind of power over you as a believer to where you're that trapped. The reason we're trapped in sin, the reason why we feel entangled by sin is, again, we don't have a right view of God. We don't have a strong enough view of what the cross actually accomplished. And we don't have a right enough view of the holiness of God and the demands that God places on our lives as his people. You want to conquer your sin? Then be conquered by the greatness of God. You want to live free of your sin? Then recognize the true freedom that Christ has given you. Don't buy into the lie that you can't break free. Don't buy into the lie that you're too far gone. Don't buy into the lie that you've done too much. Don't buy into the lie that you're addicted and can't run away. Grace is sufficient to break every chain of sin on your life. But you have to embrace it, not abuse it. So if you don't know this, sin's a defeated enemy. Sin is a dead enemy. Because at the cross, Jesus killed it. You know, a few weeks ago, Renee and some of the ladies of this church went to a women's event at Falls Creek, which means Jonathan and I got to have some father-son time. And we had a blast. He said something about dad dad being his favorite. I don't know. I can't quote it word for word, but he did. Uh, but we, I decided that another buddy of mine, his wife, was going to this retreat too. So we said, hey, let's get our kids together on Saturday. Let's meet at McAllister's in Tulsa, and then we'll go to the gathering place. Because parents, here's a hack for you. The McAllister kids' meal cost $1. And they get Smuckers and a bowl of mac and cheese. Jonathan's happy place. All right? So we said we're going to go to McAllister's, and we did. And so my friend Colin from Calvary, Inola, he comes in with his two kids, and his oldest son just can't wait to tell me that he shot his first turkey. I mean, he's proud of it. He goes, I shot my first turkey. He goes, Rio, Rio, I shot it. I, I, got, I got my first turkey. Like, that kid is addicted now because he got his first one. And then Colin looks at me and says, I've got to show you this video. And I'm going, man, he managed to capture a live video of shooting the turkey. That's pretty impressive. It was so much better than that. It was a video of the turkey. He's already been shot laying in a driveway. And his son's walking around. You know, he's giddy. He shot, the, he shot his first turkey. He's all excited. And I hear my buddy Colin cheer him on in the background. And then all of a sudden, this dead turkey moves. <laughs> Jerks around. Scares his son, and Colin's laughing in the background. I mean, oh, his son thought that this turkey was dead. I mean, why is a dead turkey still moving? But you know this if you've ever hunted. 
that last gasp is that animal's strongest fight back. Why do you think sin seems so prevalent in your life today? It's its last gasp before Jesus returns. And it always fights the hardest when it's dead. So yes, the battle is hard. Yes, fighting sin is not easy. Paul's going to say later on in Romans chapter 8, put sin to death. John Owen, the great Puritan, said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. This is a work we are called to do, not to be saved or not to earn God's favor. This is a work we do equipped by the grace of God to overcome the sin that's already been defeated in our lives. Come this last week. Victory is already yours. Just walk in it. Victory over sin belongs to those who are in Christ Jesus. Trust God's grace to overcome it. You fight a defeated, dead enemy. It's going to fight harder as its death draws near. Fight harder by the grace of God. Because in Christ, you have been set free to embrace this great grace that enables you to conquer the sin in your life that's already been conquered by the cross of Christ. And you're free now to embrace it freely. You don't have to worry about, do I have to improve enough? Do I have to do enough? No, no, no. Simply draw near to the throne. Receive the help you need. And the help you need is moment by moment, day by day, second by second. And it's freely given to you. But you have to embrace it, not abuse it. Because we are set free to embrace God's grace. And yes, it is a hard work to kill sin. It is hard to deny self and live trusting the grace of God. And at times we'll think our life as a Christian is just going to be miserable because we're always fighting sin. We're always saying no to the things that we want to do. But you haven't been set free to be miserable. You have been set free to enjoy your new life. We are set free to enjoy our new life in Christ. Verse 3 states, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Now, catch this. At the very end of verse 4 is Paul's application for these four verses. You've been set free to walk in the newness of life, to enjoy the new life you have in Christ. You've been set free. But notice he's going to use baptism in verses 3 and 4 to drive his point home. And so we need to understand baptism if we're going to understand Paul's point. And there are very few topics that people are confused about as much as baptism. Now, if you don't know, there's a show that just ended named Young Sheldon. If you've watched it, you know it's a, it's a decently funny show. But the very last episode, I won't spoil anything for you, was essentially Sheldon's mother begging him and his sister to get baptized so she knows they go to heaven when they die. And what's even crazier to me is that Apparently, they go to a Southern Baptist church, and they believe it's baptism that gets them to heaven. There's confusion in Southern Baptist churches about what baptism is. I can't tell you how many times I've met with somebody, and they say, I want to get baptized. Why? Well, because I want to be saved and go to heaven. There is confusion as to what baptism is. People think it's necessary for salvation, or people think it's not at all something we're supposed to do. We just do it if we want to. So let's kind of nail it down. What is baptism? You know, baptism is a physical representation of a spiritual reality. You know why Paul mentions baptism here in verses 3 and 4? Because in the first century church, the idea of being a believer and not being baptized was unheard of. No, it wasn't unheard of because baptism makes them saved. It wasn't unheard of because baptism added to their salvation. It was because baptism represented to the church body what had happened in that person's spiritual life. This is why when we baptize people here, you'll hear me say when they go to, down in the water, you've been buried in likeness with Christ. When they come up, raised to walk in the newness of life. It's not the act of baptism that does that. Baptism is a picture of what's already happened. In baptism, someone tells the church that I have died to my sin. I've died with Christ. He died for my sin, so I've died to my sin. I've repented and trusted in him, and I've been made alive and raised with him. It's what baptism is a picture of. Baptism doesn't add to your salvation. Baptism doesn't make you super saved. If you get saved this morning and you go home and get in a car wreck and die, before you get baptized, you will still find yourself in heaven. 
This is necessary because there's confusion on this. People think, well, I need to be baptized to be saved. No, but if you are saved, you need to be baptized. Baptism is the first act of obedience in the new believer's life. It is where you tell the people of God that you have died to sin and you've been risen in Christ. Baptism is not one of those commands that are optional. There are no optional commands in the Bible, by the way. You are to be baptized. If you are saved, you are to be baptized. Because you are telling people, I no longer belong to myself. I belong to Christ. I've died to my sin because Christ died for my sin. I've been buried with Christ. The old man has passed away. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. So baptism is not what makes you new, but it represents that you've been made new, and it tells the church that you are a brother and si or sister in Christ. Because baptism is a physical representation of the spiritual reality. It is also a declaration of new life. You are declaring to others in the church that you belong to Christ. I'm going to get on a little soapbox here for a minute. This is why I am not for baptism taking place outside of the local church. I don't agree with it. Because baptism is not this little party you get to be a part of. Baptism is a declaration to your other brothers and sisters throughout generations that you belong to Jesus. That's what baptism is. Baptism is an ordinance of the local church because the church is involved with it. And you go, well, how? I mean, we have a pastor baptized or a father baptized. When someone makes the declaration they belong to Christ and they are new, it is also a declaration to the church to begin the work of discipleship. You see, we have an unhealthy fascination with statistics in our culture, especially in our church culture. You realize the book of Acts didn't care about statistics? They're an OCD person's worst nightmare. They said, and thousands came to know Christ that day. You know, the Holy Spirit could have told Luke exactly what number to write, and he chose not to. Thousands, hundreds. Uh, they weren't concerned with statistics. They celebrated new life. They celebrated the baptisms that were happening. But what do you find recorded in intricate detail in the book of Acts? Discipleship. See, we have an unhealthy fascination where we think as a church, okay, as long as our baptism numbers are up and our ACP numbers look really good, we had a good year. I notice no one said amen to that one. Well, we had a lot of baptisms this year, so we're good to go. We had a lot of baptisms this year, so we're a healthy church. Heretical churches have hundreds of baptisms a year. Is baptism the goal? No. Do we celebrate baptism? Absolutely. Baptism isn't our end point, though. That's our starting point. Because when someone goes through these baptism waters and they declare, I belong to Christ, guess what they're also declaring? They belong to the church. And the worst thing the church can do is to say, we got them baptized. Our job is done. I don't care if we have a hundred baptisms. A hundred baptisms, well, a hundred people being discipled is 100 failures. Let me say that again for those of you who are like, what did he just say? A hundred baptisms without a hundred people being discipled is a hundred failures. Does the church exist? Just to baptize people or to take baptized people and grow them in Christ's likeness? Well, that's the pastor's job. No, it's not. It's to equip believers to then equip other believers to then empower other believers to fulfill their God-given purpose and be disciples who make disciples. See, we've got to get out of this understanding that baptism is salvific or that it's a sign of success. It's not, neither one of those things. It is healthy when there are baptisms in the church. It is unhealthy when there are none. But numbers don't dictate health. People growing in Christ's likeness dictate health. What does it matter? If we have record-setting baptism numbers every year, but men are not discipled to step up and lead their homes, what does it matter if we have record-setting numbers every year, and yet we don't help people understand the cultural war going on and how they engage with it? 
Are baptisms insignificant? No, and, and I hope after this you don't think I think that. But I also know it's a signal that our work starts, not a signal that our work is done. And until we get that right, until we understand baptism rightly, there are going to be numerous issues that arise in the local church. Baptism is not salvific. Baptism is not a sign of how healthy you are. Baptism is a signal that you now have the work to equip this person to grow in Christ's likeness, to grow in their sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, and to stir them to greater works and has all the more as we see the day drawing near. Baptism is a symbol and it is a signal. It's not unimportant. And it's the first act of obedience that you take part of as a new believer. See, when I was saved at 13 years old, I told my parents I wanted to be baptized. Saved, I need to be baptized. But my parents didn't give in for a while because I was raised Catholic. And as a Catholic, I was baptized as an infant into the Catholic Church. And so my parents, they weren't malicious about it, they weren't rude about it, but they didn't understand why did I need to be baptized. I'd already been baptized. And for one year, I was miserable. You know why I was miserable? Because I wanted to be baptized and follow in obedience, and I couldn't. You know, I don't remember a whole lot of how I felt during certain years in middle school, but I remember that year. And I remember the joy when I got to be baptized. And I got to tell my church family that I belong to them because I belong to Christ. There was a joy there. Because baptism is an act of obedience. And when you participate and you obey the Lord, there's always joy. It doesn't save you. It didn't make me more saved. But there's joy in obedience to God. There might be some of you here this morning who you say, I'm saved and I've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I was baptized as a kid. I gave my life to Christ later on and I haven't been baptized since. You think that lack of joy in your life could be because the Lord's telling you your baptism on the right side of your salvation? See, I wonder how many people say, would say, well, I was a kid. I walked the aisle. I said the prayer. I didn't know what I was doing. Got baptized. But I got saved later on. But I already been baptized. I didn't think I needed to again. But baptism follows conversion. It doesn't precede it. So today, if you haven't been scripturally baptized, today might be the day the Lord's telling you to come forward and to say, I need to be baptized. Or you might be saying, well, I've been thinking baptism will save me, so I've been meaning to come forward, but what do you mean baptism doesn't save me? What saves me? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What sets you free? Baptism doesn't set you free. It's a symbol that you've been set free. Baptism shows us that you belong to Christ. How do you belong to Christ? You trust in Christ. You repent of your sin and you believe in his finished work. As Romans will say later on in chapter 10, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. The Bible says that all who call on him the Lord will be saved. So what is God calling you to do today as an unbeliever? Is he calling you to come forward and be baptized? No, he is calling you to come forward and to be set free from your sin by his grace alone and Christ alone for his glory alone. He is calling you not to think the waters in this baptistry are what set you free, but to come forward and trust in the one who sets you free and sets you free indeed. Because Paul is writing these four verses to tell us that baptism shows that we have been set free from our sin, that we have trusted in Christ, we have been saved by Christ, that we belong now to the universal church, we belong to each other in this church, and we now stir one another up to love and good works as we keep our eyes on the gospel, we keep our eyes on God, we have a greater and a deeper view of who God is, and we trust Him. Even when a tornado rips through Claremore, and we wonder what's going to happen tomorrow, we trust a big God who has set us free from sin, who has set us free from death, and who has made us new in Christ alone. That's why baptism matters. That's why this free life matters. And that's why it matters that we recognize we have not been set free from the reign of Christ. We are under the reign of Christ because that's where freedom is found. You have been set free to live free, to enjoy the new life you have in Christ. You know how you enjoy this new life in Christ? You enjoy Christ. You know how you enjoy this new life that God gave you? You enjoy God. You enjoy learning more about Him from His Word and being drawn to worship. You enjoy keeping your eyes on Him and listening to the ever-speaking voice of the Holy Spirit drawing you away from sin and convicting you of sin by the power of His Word. 
you learn to enjoy being with the Lord. Not simply doing for the Lord. Because this new life wasn't meant to add a greater burden upon you. It wasn't meant to keep you in shackles. This free life is given for you to enjoy. To embrace the grace of God and enjoy the new life you have in Christ. And this freedom is yours to have if you will listen to the Holy Spirit and what he is telling you to do. If he's telling you to come and trust in Christ and be saved, then come and trust in Christ. If he is telling you to come today and get your baptism on the right side of your salvation, then come and follow through in obedience. And if he is calling you today to take that sin that you have given power over your life and to rely on his grace to overcome it, then come pray today and say, this sin does not have power over me anymore. Grace does. Today the invitation is very simple. Come to Jesus and live.